for uh, inviting me. I thought it was, uh, has been a fascinating uh, conference so far. I uh, learned a lot, and um, uh, I think uh, actually it's quite interesting to hear uh, from some of our uh, uh, medievalists and, 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 and colleagues because sometimes, uh, I mean, you know, I'm more of a modern historian and political scientist, and we tend to ignore all of that. Uh, and uh, there are good reasons for that, but um, it's also really uh, <coughs> at, at, our, at our peril, of course. But, uh, you know, we wouldn't really want to be called an Orientalist by someone uh, of, of some standing, so uh, we, we, we just do that. Um, but um, I've learned a lot, and so I will try to, um, you know, uh, link that a little bit um, back. Um, and one of the um, uh, problems, I suppose, of, of writing the history of, of, of many of the regions that we talk about, but particularly the, the, the region that, that I'm focusing on today, um, now Eastern <coughs> Arabia, but also other parts of the Arabian Peninsula, um, is that sources are a real problem. Um, and especially if we go back further than, let's say, the 19th century. Um, and if we go back to periods um, uh, such as the, you know, the ones that you were talking about, it really becomes very, very difficult um, to, to figure out well, what happened. Um, and uh, so in the case of the, of the Shia, um, 12 Shia nowadays who live in, the eastern, uh, in eastern Arabia, it's actually really quite difficult to say you know, where they come from and when they converted uh, to 12 Shiism or when they adopted 12 Shiism. And in my book, I haven't really tried to answer that because, um, yeah, for, for all these uh, reasons. But, um, you know, given that I'm here now, I will, I will try to do uh, so now. And um, uh, it probably, so, you know, we've heard about the Fatimids and the Ismaili uh, uh, period. And there is probably some kind of link to the, to the Ismailis, to the Karamita uh, of Eastern Arabia, uh, who established a, an Ismaili state um, in the 9th, uh, 10th century uh, that lasted, I think, two, two three hundred years. And, um, uh, but the question, when uh, the population in Eastern Arabia converted from Is uh, Ismaili Shiism to Travel Shiism, for example, has never really been answered, and I also can't really uh, uh, answer that. It happened at some point in between, probably around the 14th, 15th century, um, uh, uh, something like that. And uh, what happened then, so this was basically concentrated, uh, Shiism there was a kind of a phenomenon concentrated in the port towns and oases uh, of Katif and Al-Aqsa uh, and in Bahrain. Um, and Bahrain, uh, one of the oldest centers of, of, of Shiism, one of the few places where Shia clerics uh, also survived, and then famously when the Safavids uh, led a top-down conversion of Iran, they got clerics from uh, um, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, and Bahrain to come and uh, work there. So these are actually really quite old um, uh, centers of Shiism. Um, and I'm you know, emphasizing that because in some of the more current polemics that we've also heard about, um, uh, the, um, some of the Wahhabi clerics uh, say that, well, these uh, Shia, they, they came from Iran at some point, and uh, well, they're basically, they're not Arabs, um, uh, the, the ones who live in Saudi Arabia. And um, that is uh, historically not true. Um, in fact, these are some of the oldest uh, communities of, 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 of Shia um, anywhere in the world. Um, and um, so, and what happened then is that the tribes, uh, I mean, obviously there is a kind of Khaldunian uh, um, um, uh, dynamic going on in Eastern Arabia where the tribes uh, uh, around these oasis towns are usually the, the, the ruling uh, on these, these areas apart from periods where the Ottomans uh, conquered the, the region um, uh, in, in, in the 16th century. Um, but then they also allied themselves with uh, a couple of strong tribes, in particular the Bani Khalid. <coughs> and this is another big uh, controversy. Um, did the Bani Khalid, who were the strongest tribes in the eastern province, um, did they convert to Shiism or not? And in their official histories, they obviously completely deny that. And, uh, given that uh, nowadays, uh, I mean, they were defeated by the Al Saud and, and, and so on and so forth, and their allies, and uh, intermarried with, with the Al Saud. Um, and uh, uh, given that um, Ibn Saud told his sons, uh, you know, he should in, they should intermarry with all the elites, with all the urban and uh, tribal elites of the country, but never to marry 
um, a Shia, uh, uh, this would constitute the problem if they would if they would admit um, you know to, to having been Shia uh, at some point or another. But I think it's 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 fair to say that at least parts of this tribe, uh, in particular in some of the ruling branches, also convert to to twelve Shiism. Um, partly because it was easier then to rule uh, uh, some of the villages um, where they were, um, uh, you know, installed as governments and so on and so forth. So we have a process that's actually quite similar to what happened in Iraq, in southern Iraq, where also some tribes converted uh, even quite late um, in the 19th century to, to Shiism. But as I say, quite a lot of this is speculation or is based on one side or another of the narrative. Because the Shia um, uh, established their own kind of historiography now of, of this period. And I published a piece in Ichmas uh, about this. But this uh, historiography is really confined to the Shia. And in the state uh, historiography, they're completely left out. And so I liked when you showed a picture of um, uh, you know, the national, was it the Dara? Or, or, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the national history uh, uh, as a, um, association which uh, you know, consistently writes uh, the Shia out of Saudi history as if they never existed. Uh, only at times when there were raids on them, that's when they come up in, 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 in the history books uh, and so on so, and so forth. So uh, it's really quite difficult to establish you know, what went on um, before um, um, the 19th century or, or let's say before the 18th century. Because what changes in the 18th century is that um, the Wahhabi movement uh, emerges. And I think um, you know, in the middle of the 18th century, we have the famous alliance between uh, Muhammad Abu Wahhab and uh, you know, first the first emir of, of the, of the al-Saud uh, uh, family. And uh, they establish uh, an alliance that is still uh, intact today. And, and what is special about um, this alliance is that um, it is a Puritan movement that wants to purify um, Islam from all its corrupt practices. And um, I think it's important to emphasize that this was not only targeted against the Shia in the East, but uh, particularly also um, you know, targeting uh, other um, pra religious practices seen as heterodox in Najd, uh, but also in the rest of the Arabian Peninsula. So it was also equally um, targeting the Sufis that were the most prominent um, uh, religious groups uh, in the Hijaz. Uh, and uh, other uh, and the Zaydis and Ismailis more to the south, um, and then the 12 Shia in the east and uh, to the north. So it was a movement that kind of wanted to uh, establish uh, uh, had, uh, one form of Islamic practice across uh, I mean, the Arabian Peninsula and then further afield, but uh, the communities that were living closest to Najd felt you know, that uh, first. And this is really when uh, we have these, uh, the first instances of, of very, very serious, I suppose, sectarian violence. And um, um, so we have frequent raids of, of the Wahhabi uh, 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 forces, and the new forces uh, conquering other parts of the Arabian Peninsula and uh, um, trying to apply their uh, ideas on the local population, which um, often results in um, the destruction of uh, sites of worship that are seen as not subscribing to Wahhabi um, uh, ideas and uh, uh, expulsion or killing of people who do not want to repent or, or convert. Um, uh, so this obviously has a big impact uh, on the eastern province. But so I must say that in the case of Saudi Arabia and uh, in the case of, of this kind of Wahhabi uh, Shia uh, sectarian Tension. Um, it is about politics, of course. It's about conquest and, and, and legitimating that conquest with an ideology. But it is also really about uh, ideas in this particular case, um, uh, and it is about um, religion because um, at least the, 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 the Wahhabi clerics and some of the tribal militias, um, the Ikhwan, are motivated by um, a religious seal uh, and uh, commit these uh, uh, acts. Uh, because they think they're right and, and, and uh, they're doing something um, right. Now, that's not to say that uh, I think later on um, uh, this becomes much more about politics, but I mean, in the beginning, this is really a missionary movement, uh, a Puritan movement. Um, and I suppose you, know, you could uh, uh, say a thing or two about um, that too. Then, of course, in the 19th century, and uh, Sama told us we should focus on the 19th century, so we'll try to say a few things about the 19th century. 
um, we have a bit of a better, we have a bit more sources. Um, and in the 19th century, we have uh, uh, the Ottomans re-establishing control um, uh, in, in various parts of, of the Arabian Peninsula, um, and particularly also in Eastern Arabia. So from 1871 until 1913, the Eastern province uh, is actually governed uh, by the Ottomans again, and that is the period, obviously, of the Tanzimat and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, these communities actually participate in some of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, developments in, 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 the, in, in the Ottoman Empire, and uh, there has been quite little research done on that period. Um, and and um, I myself don't speak uh, Ottoman. I, I I had a good look at uh, at, uh, at um, uh, uh, some of the documents in the Ottoman archives, and as far as I can see. They do not really uh, uh, talk much about um, uh, the, the religious dimension of these communities, but they did accept uh, some of the Shia notables as governors of their the towns where they formed majorities uh, for certain periods, while also appointing members of this uh, Bani Khalid tribe um, that I mentioned before as, as governors of other regions. So we have actually an integration of some of the Shia notable families uh, into the Ottoman state, and I think that's um, quite fascinating. But, but again, uh, more research needs to be um, done uh, about this. And actually, I can only really say from Shia historiography, uh, sadly Shia historiography, they present this period of the Ottoman uh, rule, um, late 19th century, early 20th century, as their, uh, um, their nakhda, actually, they call it, um, uh, as a period where they were free to practice their religion, um, it was uh, uh, considered better than uh, earlier periods of the 19th century and late 18th century when you had frequent uh, tribal raids and, and the Wahhabis were conquering and, uh, the period, uh, uh, the region uh, at, at, at various times and, and they were suffering from that. Um, so they paint this period of Ottoman rule in a very positive um, light and contrast it especially uh, with the conquest that happened in 1913 when uh, Ibn Saud, the founder of the modern state, returns from um, and after his return from exile in Kuwait, and reestablishes control over first the Najd and then the other regions that come to make up um, uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, it is really from then on, so in the 20th century, I suppose, that we can speak um, of, of political sectarianism, where sectarianism is used as a state practice um, uh, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, and, but here are also there are competing uh, narratives about um, what the role of the Saudi state is. So on the one hand, if uh, you know the, the, the state was following through on, on the original Wahhabi notions that um, either all of these people should uh, convert, should uh, uh, abandon their practices, or they have to leave or they have to be killed, then uh, we should find a, a, you know almost complete homogenous uh, religious landscape in Saudi Arabia today. But um, that is not the case, um, and uh, in, in fact, uh, the contrary is the case. Uh, there are uh, uh, Sunni Muslims from all the four madhabs, in particular in the eastern province, in the, in, in, in the Lhasa. You still have uh, all the four madhabs uh, are present, and they have their own, uh, they have their own schools, they have their own uh, clerics, uh, and so on and so forth. And they are also, uh, to varying degrees, discriminated by the against by the state. So they're not generally part of the, of the, of the Wahhabi clerical uh, bodies, um, the highest bodies of the state. Um, and you have the Sufis still, the Ismailis and, and some Zaydis, uh, in addition to the 12 Shia and, and, and all kinds of other things. So in fact, the state did not follow through on the most uh, hardcore demands um, uh, of the Wahhabi clerics and of the Ikhwan uh, militia. Having said that, however, um, because the Ikhwan were the army uh, used to conquer um, um, you know, the, the territory that makes up uh, the country, um, they did in fact uh, at some point um, uh, force some of the Shia notables to convert in 1927, um, and, um, um, but uh, were later on crushed. So the, the use of sectarianism uh, and, and kind of anti-Shiism by the state is, is not a straightforward uh, one um, uh, one way game, uh, if you like. Um, generally, the state has used anti Shiism, but it has also, um, I mean, protected the Shia generally from the most extreme, uh, I mean, forms of, of, of violence. Um, that is until uh, last year. And so, um, some of the things that uh, you, you showed, uh, these bombings, um, uh, it's actually quite striking that these bombings uh, claimed by IS um, are the first, um, I mean, uh, uh, 
real acts of, of violence against um, against Shia places of worship in Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, well, since since the conquest of of, of that uh, region, so uh, you obviously had uh, other kinds of problems, but you never had this kind of uh, uh, outright um, uh, violence. So there was, in some ways. Um, and the, the Shia claim that uh, an agreement uh, uh, was struck between Ibn Saud and the Shia notables when he came to the eastern province, and that they actually have uh, um, that uh, document uh, where it was signed, uh, but no one's ever seen it, and, 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 and no one has given it to me or, or, or to anyone else. But that in return for a political quietism and uh, uh, you know, not resisting uh, the conquest of the eastern province, um, they would be given. Uh, they would be at least given safety. So um, this kind of this um, um, is is one of the kind of the, the only real bargain between uh, the Shia and the state. Um, but let's uh, fast forward a bit because I think um, while there is this religious element, uh, you know, with the Wahhabis disliking the Shia, and that's been a constant uh, in, the, in the history of the Saudi Kingdom, I think it's really after 1979 that uh, this becomes a huge issue and where the Saudi state um, starts to use really anti-Shiism as a key part of its domestic politics and of its uh, um, uh, foreign uh, uh, policy uh, as well, and of its, uh, um, you know, trying to shore up its legitimacy uh, both at home and in the wider uh, Islamic world. And that's obviously in response to the um, Iranian revolution. And uh, uh, so the, after 1979, we have a kind of two-track uh, development. On the one hand, uh, the marginalized Shia communities in, in the Arab world uh, start to be partly inspired by the Iranian revolution and you have uh, uh, political movements mobilizing uh, these communities. The same happens in Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain, um, and so on and so forth. So you do have, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, mobilization on the level um, of the Shia, but of course you have the state uh, uh, using these kind of mobilizations, which in fact do not constitute an existential threat to the state, because they are uh, they are confined to that community, but the state makes sure that these mobilizations stay in fact confined uh, uh, to that um, particular community. And uh, the state, I mean in all the Gulf states, but also in, in other states, um, is, is very wary of cross-sectarian uh, uh, mobilization, um, uh, in the period of the Arab Cold War, obviously leftist movements, Arab nationalist movements, which are also uh, prominent in, in that part um, uh, of the Arab world, um, are seen as the greatest threat. And so sectarianism and, and the divide and rule strategy um, become a, a tool of, of, of governance. And um, uh, it is really, I think, yeah, after 79 that um, kind of this, uh, this key, I mean, uh, anti-Shiism becomes this kind of key strategy. And then under Abdullah, we have this brief period where there's some kind of uh, uh, accommodation. I call it marginal recognition in my uh, book. Um, uh, um, this insistence on uh, wasatiya, on, on some kind of national dialogue, uh, and so on and so forth. But I think, unfortunately, from today's perspective, we have to say that this was, a, this was an interim period. And under the new king, uh, almost all of these uh, kind of developments have been, uh, I mean, have been reversed. And so we're back now to a, to a period where um, anti-Shiism uh, is again used as a domestic and foreign policy strategy, and where in fact the alliance um, with the more um, uh, extreme uh, uh, elements of the clerical establishment uh, and some uh, Salafis uh, that are outside of the clerical establishment has been reaffirmed. Uh, and uh, the war in Yemen is kind of one of the main outlets for that new alliance. Um, uh, support for the Syrian uh, uh, rebels is another uh, outlet, and it all really happens in the context of uh, perceived threat um, of Iran and uh, the, the attempt to establish a really broad uh, anti-Iranian alliance. And um, I'm afraid to say that in this uh, broader geopolitical context, um, the, the situation of uh, uh, you know of the, of the Shia in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, is, is rather bleak, um, uh, given uh, the added uh, problem of, of, of the Islamic State, of course. So, I have uh, half a minute. Who profits from sectarianism in Saudi Arabia? I'll ask you a question, I hope. But um, uh, So, obviously, quite a lot of people. Um, uh, it is a ruling strategy, so the state profits from it, since it's one of the longest running, uh, I mean, it's, it's I mean, a, a dynasty that has been there for a very, very long time, uh, also in reg regional comparison. Almost all of these other uh, old Cold War allies of, of the United States uh, uh, were overthrown. 
Uh, some had to move from country to country, as we heard uh, uh, with, with the Jordanian monarchy before, but the al Saud are still there. So clearly, um, they haven't done um, that badly, um, uh, at least for themselves. Um, on the other hand, there are also the clerics who profit uh, um, since, uh, um, and, and this is actually a two-way uh, street again, and I think uh, what's quite specific about the Saudi Shia community is that clerics play a huge role, and I think this is partly to do with, with this kind of um, anti-Shia um, uh, uh, discourse and so on and so forth, that people say, well, you know, we're criticized for our religion, so we have to put a cleric in front that he can, you know, argue on that level of... Uh, uh, of religion, and um, so I think, and the clerics are actually much more important in, in Saudi Arabia than, for example, in Bahrain, which is very close. Uh, but so, you know, um, uh, clearly there have been uh, other developments. And the Americans probably also profit, uh, but uh, uh, I think that we have uh, not much more time to go that. <laughs> well, I mean, I think one of the things that was quite remarkable. Uh, uh, in the WikiLeaks uh, was that um, I think a very, very substantial part uh, of 20% or something like that, 25% of all the cables coming out from Saudi Arabia actually dealt with the Shia, the Saudi Shia, which is, I think, I mean, remarkable because um, if you look at earlier periods in the 50s and 60s, um, uh, the Americans actually didn't have such a very good uh, idea of, of uh, Arab societies or what went on there. I mean, I've got through the through the records, uh, um, they usually don't really know what Sunni Shia, uh, these kind of things. The Brits are much better at classifying people uh, at that time in, in this part of the world. Uh, Americans are, you know, have to judge Arabs and non-Arabs. That's one thing. They can, they can, you know, Aramco does that. Um, but by if we go back to the up in the 2000s, you know, it becomes very, very clear that there's a real focus on knowing everything about the Saudi Shia community, meeting all the leaders. Uh, you know, people from the uh, consulate even met with Nimr al uh and were in fact quite impressed with him, you know, his reading and so on and so forth, and the positive things he said about the you know, American constitution and so on and so forth. Um, so quite a lot of people profit um, uh, from it, and it's obviously related not just to local politics, uh, but uh, to international politics. And I'm happy to take the question.